Hello there. Scarborough Fair. The recorded version that I made of Scarborough Fair is not the same as the popular version recorded by um, Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel, of course. Um, they, of course, um, recorded the fantastic version, made a beautiful job of it, and, of course, it became a famous hit all over the world. So that melody of theirs is the one that most people think of when they think of the tune Scarborough Fair. However, <clears throat> I have a book here by um, uh, Lucy Broadwood and J.A. Fuller Maitland. And in that book, this is a book of English country, sorry, English county songs. And in this book we have a version of Scarborough Fair, which was collected in Whitby, which is a lovely place in Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, beautiful place. Uh, Whitby was collected in 1891 by a Whitby fisherman, a gentleman called William Moat. And of course Whitby is well known for the uh, connection to Dracula, of course, and the Abbey and everything. It's, it's worth a visit if you have ever come to England. It's well worth a visit. Beautiful place. Um, <clears throat> so this, this is a very early version of Scarborough Fair. Now Scarborough of course is not very far south of Whitby, had many a, a happy holiday there in the past and I believe there used to be a, an annual fair at Scarborough where the, um, the local rural community would get together, sell their cattle, sell horses, whatever, and people would come in from miles around. So it was a special event. And Scarborough Fair has this tune attached to it. Now, the interesting thing about the, um, the story behind the lyrics of Scarborough Fair is, once again, it's this um, story of a young woman who um, desires the attention of a young man. Well, nothing new in that, you may say. Um, but, of course, the young man has a bit of a roving eye and he doesn't really want the attentions of just one lady. So he tries to put her off by asking her to um, carry out some impossible tasks. Well, one of the tasks is, she says, um, <clears throat> in this, origin this very early version, um, can you please tell him to bring me an acre of land between the wild ocean and the yon yonder sea sand. Well, I, if you've been to the seaside, you'll know that the area between the sand and the yonder sea is water. So it would be rather difficult unless you were to drain all the water off. So in that time, it would have been an impossible task. In the more well-known version, um, he, he asks the young woman to um, making him a cambric shirt without any needlework or stitches or seams. To use the actual wording, it's without any seam or needlework. Well, I don't know about you, but all my shirts have got seams and needlework holding the things together. So once again, he's, he's giving her a rather impossible task. And this particular story is a story that crops up quite a bit in folk songs where um, perhaps the young woman uh, um, seeking the attention of the young man is given the run round, basically, in plain language. Similar story to the one of the Elvin Knight, really, in um, Tam Lin, where um, young Janet has to... Um, break the spell for um, the elven knight to basically um, break him out of the spell of the fairy queen. So it's a similar sort of theme 
in that respect. <clears throat> there are other themes actually similar as well. Often the young man goes away to sea and um, when he comes back he tries to hoodwink his bride that he's somebody else. I don't know how he th thinks he can get away with that but there we go. He comes back and he says I'm somebody else will you do you fancy me and he then checks out whether or not she is loyal to him. If she makes a pass at him then he knows that she's not going to be loyal but if she says no I am betrothed to one lover then of course he knows that she is faithful to him. So all of these folk songs seem to have that kind of um, story running through them. So Scarborough Fair is no different but of course it's been made famous by Simon and Garfunkel. So where does this tie into my fiddle tune? Well <laughs> Paul Simon came over to um, England in the 60s. Yeah I was around then and I do remember. I didn't meet him personally although he did sing at my a local folk club to where I was living at the time. Um, his, I believe it was his first performance in, in England at Brentwood Folk Club. I don't know if it still exists but it did at the time and it was very popular. Um, so he sang there and at some stage while going round the various folk clubs in England he met Martin Carthy. Now Martin Carthy is a very well known folk singer in the UK. Um, he of course had a very famous um, duo with Dave Swarbrick, a fantastic fiddle player. If you haven't heard of Dave Swarbrick look him up, he's fantastic. Dave Swarbrick. Sadly no longer with us but a great guy. Very influential. Um, started a lot of fiddle players like myself off on the road of learning to play the violin. Well anyway, Paul Simon met Martin Carthy at some stage and Martin Carthy is a great exponent of English traditional songs. He has a, a great way of um, singing, them, singing them and presenting them. And at some stage he taught Scarborough Fair to Paul Simon who I believe then went back to the States and he was already in a duo with Art Garfunkel and again they decided that this would be a good song to record and what a beautiful job they made of it. Their harmonies are stunning, no doubt about it. So we all tend to know the song Scarborough Fair, are you going to Scarborough Fair, that one. We all tend to know that but of course there are different versions. Now the one in this book here is totally different. It's actually a jig. Uh, da, 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 da. It's, it's a jig basically. Perhaps I'll make a separate video, record that and so you can listen to it. But um, why did I choose to change the melody that we're all used to with my Scarborough Fair? Well because I um, have read around the subject and I already knew the story and I had a feel for the place as well. And I thought there was a little bit of melancholy in it. I thought the young lady was being given the run round and I felt she was being hoodwinked and I felt that was quite sad. So in mine, I dropped mine into a sort of more minor key. Um, I'd also listened to Martin Carthy's version so I kind of had a feel for the way that his version went. Um, so when I came to putting my version together I tried to combine all that together plus the fact that I knew the background to where the song may have originated and also a little bit about that area. So, so that's, that, that's my, my reasoning. Now um, I'll get the fiddle and I'll play it for you as soon as I can find it. Where have I put it? Oh there it is. <clears throat> Not to worry, just a senior moment. <laughs> um, I play this tune in E flat. Now I don't play it in E flat to be awkward. 
Um, I know some people might say, he's been awkward, he's playing it in E flat. But actually, the reason is simple, because I like to do a bottom counter melody. I drop the tune right down onto the lower strings and play the melody underneath the original melody. Now, in the key of E flat, I can do that. But then I'm going to suggest, I'm sorry, what am I saying? <clears throat> It's not the key of E flat, it's the key of B flat. Sorry, another senior moment, I'm afraid. The key of B flat. Now don't worry because the notation will be either on the screen or in the community section. So we can make sure we get the right music to play along with this one. But yeah, I play it in two flats, in B flat. And um, in actual fact, it plays pretty well in F, which is one flat. And I think if you're first learning the violin, the fiddle, whatever you want to call it, I think it's perhaps slightly easier to play in F. Right, this is the tune in B flat. tune is this. So basically if you play that below the uh, upper melody you get quite a nice um, effect so that's the tune in B flat and I'll just play through it slowly now um, the only tricky thing I think if you're first learning the violin are these flats now there is a B flat that's on that A string and there's also an E flat so we're not going to be playing the open E. You've got to bring your little finger or your pinky down onto this slightly uh, flattened E, which is played on the A string actually. Those are the only two tricky notes. And there's a, a tricky bit where we flip. where we flip from the G on the D string and we flip to the D on the A string. If you can try, sort of form a bridge with your uh, ring finger, it's quite handy, but don't worry if you can't. Well, I'll play through it slowly anyway, so you can, you can hear it played slowly. So as I say, the only tricky bit might be that jumping from, from the G on the D string to the D on the A string. I'll show you where that is. There's an E flat. See, there's that tricky jump. G, uh, D, G. And then we've got a 
jump again. Slide down there from the C natural. So the only tricky things are hitting that E flat, B flat, and bridging between the G and the D on the D and the A string. That sounds complicated, but you know, basically holding your ring finger down on the third note of the D string and the A string. It's worth practicing that, very handy. Um, saves you a lot of fiddling around trying to find the notes. So that's the uh, main melody and the bottom melody is like this. So we've got a um, we've got the E flat on that D string which is basically let's go on to the D and the E flat's the first note up. Sounds a bit odd. Anyway, I'll play it in context. So that gives you both of those variations. So if you fancy uh, recording yourself playing the top one and then the bottom one, stick your headphones on, of course, so you can hear yourself playing and have a go. It sounds nice when you put the two um, tunes together. Um, now, the other thing I was thinking, it might be easier for you to play this in the key of F, one flat. <laughs> in that key so I'll play it in that key for you and of course the notation will be there start on the A on the G start the first finger on the G string which is the A note great that version for playing in a session because um, you're not worrying about playing the lower melody so you know it's going to be easier to play because there's no faffing about with that with that E flat which is a tricky old note I reckon I remember when I was first learning I found playing an E flat really hard to do um, so yeah um, the version in F might be a lot simpler for you. Um, so you've got two versions there now. You've got the, um, the B flat version with two flats and the F version with one flat. Um, so there we go. That's Scarborough Fair. The no musical notation will be available for you. And I hope this helps you to learn to play my variation. And as soon as I get a chance, I'll record the version that's in the booklet that from the collected in the 1800s. Um, and you can hear the big difference between the two. 
Um, okay, um, thank you very much for watching and um, I'll see you again soon. Thank you.